they said it could be done. <laughs> Peter and I were talking about the right day and time for this event, and we were thinking, just a couple weeks into the semester, Friday, 5 o'clock, I don't know, but here you are. Thank you so much for coming to this event. This is Playback Theater Presents. Mitra Shaverini's book, Desert Roots, Journey of an Iranian Immigrant Family. I'm Marcy McPhee. I'm Associate Director of the International Center for Ethics, Justice, and Public Life here at Brandeis University. And it's my honor to be the MC tonight. <clears throat> this event weaves together strands from a variety of, of parts of campus. And I've asked Mitra's daughter, Donia, Donia excuse me, to, um, to come up and help me with this part. <clears throat> So as I think about all the strands that go into this event, I, I, it starts with Mitra, of course. And Mitra is the, the uh, author of the book that we celebrate tonight, but she also teaches the fall component of the, the Sorensen Fellowship, a program that, that I direct within the Ethics Center. It's her superb, challenging coaching. Go ahead and grab a Mitra strand. Uh, her, her coaching that brings out the best in the, in the Sorensen Fellows as they process their summer internship experiences all over the world and work with her the, in the fall to, to capture their experiences in words. So in addition to the strand of Mitra, we have the strand of Brandeis alumnus and playback actor Will Chalmers of the class of 07. And with a small bit of applause for Will. Uh, Will is on the worldwide board of the Center for Playback Theater, and he got his start in playback as a Sorensen Fellow. So this program that I direct, that Mitra teaches the fall class, is where Will got his start in playback in Australia and in New York as a Sorensen Fellow, and I had the privilege of supporting him as a student in those days. And he had the opportunity to learn and explore this powerful theater technique that you'll see tonight. Another strand, his partner, the Brazilian actress Sheila Donio, also on the worldwide board of directors of the Playback Society. Uh, staff, she also served as a staff member for a year within the Ethics Center, working with my colleague Cindy Cohen on the award-winning documentary, Acting Together, working, uh, exploring the uh, contributions of the arts, particularly theater, to peace building worldwide. I can't resist, it's not in my notes, but I can't resist mentioning that Shayla's mother and, and grandmother flew in from Brazil this morning, and we're very pleased to welcome them. <laughs> See Shayla on stage. Other strands. Will Chalmers and Shayla Donio, the, the uh, playback actors, are joined by Etta King of the class of 2010, one of the co founders of what was the Brandeis Playback Society, Nathan Portishaver of the class of 09, another strand, who is one of the original members of the society, Tim Van Ness a professional playbacker who has offered training on this campus. And that playback team is reunited tonight in, in what you'll see. Another strand, student respondent Lila May Pasqual of the uh, class of 2015, a sophomore, who took a class with me this past spring. So in addition to overseeing the, the Sorensen Fellowship, I also teach the Immigrant Support Services Practicum. And one of their assigned readings is the introduction to Mitra's book that you'll read, to, that you'll be hearing about tonight. They read the introduction before it was published, and I asked them to respond to it. And I gave them a lot of latitude in how they might respond, either a written reflection or something else. And Lila picked this something else. And she wrote an original song in her native Tagalog, one of the Philippine languages, which she will perform tonight and give you its English translation. So she'll be our student respondent. Mitra, the author, Professor, uh, excuse me, Lila, the student respondent, Will C. Shayla, and the playback actors are joined by Dr. Kristen Luke in one more strand of the International and Global Studies and Sociology Department as the faculty respondent. And you, the audience, are the final strand because your experience and your reaction is an important part of what you're going to hear tonight as you hear about this remarkable immigrant family journey and your response is part of tonight's experience as well. 
Thank you for coming, and now join me in welcoming and congratulating Mutra Shepherding. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> you know me, you know how nervous I am. So bear with me. Thank you everyone for coming tonight on this Friday night. As Marcy said, you've all made the journey to come here, um, to be here. I see some faces who've done some traveling to be here. I really appreciate it, thank you. Um, I am on a time, they even have time numbers for me tonight, so the main attraction is playback. I'll get right to it. Um, my book is, in essence, is a family biography. Tonight, what I want to do is share with you what the story is about, but my conversation will be about those spaces that are between the pages. The story does not necessarily mark with words. By that I mean, I would like to talk about the process of writing a family biography. I'll intermingle it with readings so that you also have an idea of how I've told our story. Let's first think about this idea of writing down our family's stories. I can comfortably assume that all of you, to some extent, partake in recording your family's histories. All of us collect family stories in one shape or another. For example, we create family albums. Photos archive our life's history. We capture milestones and events, birthdays, proms, graduations. Through photographs, we sketch characters and their personalities. A photo of a child whose face is covered with gook, or one who daringly dangles from a playground structure, tells a lot about that child's character. And we try to make our photographs chronological. Jimmy when he was two, Tommy in the third grade, Lizzie's wedding, the progression of our life in an orderly fashion. Time is an important element of those photo albums, as are people and events. So frame after frame, picture after picture, we try to record our family history and family albums. But a lot is left out. Some of the stories that go behind those photographs evaporate, like the Kodak colors that at one time captured them. And there's so many stories behind each photograph, aren't they? Think of a photo that you have, say on your office desk, on your fridge, on your bookshelves, in your wallets. In all likelihood, there's a story that goes beyond that photograph. It's perhaps even filled with a certain set of emotions, love perhaps, or nostalgia. We all have those photographs. Behind each of those photographs, there's a story. But the stories behind those photographs are typically the laws right alongside our memories. And has the, per the stories perish, the, the keeper of those photographs. So a photograph holds more than just an image. They hold our stories. And we all have those interesting stories that go behind those photographs. Interesting family histories, an infamous uncle, a crazy aunt, a mother we've never figured out, a father whose domineering personality shattered ours, brothers, sisters, grandparents, cousins, family stories abound. But how can we record those stories? And should we record those stories? If we record them, then it's important to acknowledge that we remember these events and characters in a variety of shades and hues. None of us here see an event in the same color, same shade, same hue. We witness life differently from one another. We all have our own perspective. Writing your family stories is no different. In fact, there's a similarity between writing a family biography and writing a memoir. You're recording your account based on your memories of your family's history. I'd like to quote something from Virginia Woolf. In her book, Orlando, Woolf says, memory is the seamstress and a capricious one at that. Memory runs her needle in and out, up and down, hither and thither. Memory, Woolf says, is inexplicable. So memoirs, based on our memories, as you can assume, can be problematic. Such that the New York Times book review this year commented against their tendency of oversharing. And in the New Yorker, a memoirist was likened to a drunken guest at a wedding, motivated by an overpowering need to be the center of attention. And the score gets even thicker if the narrative deals with socially unacceptable matters like abuse, addiction, family dysfunction, or even poverty. And memoirist is questioned, why are you sharing? Why are you telling? So if you want to capture your family's stories, how do you do it? To whose detriment? 
what do you gain and what do you lose? Telling a family biography is a treasure chest of stories, but also a Pandora's box. By definition, to open Pandora's box means to create evil that cannot be undone. There's fear, there's pain, there's anger. Now the word Pandora originates from the Greek language, of course. And I have a lot of Greek friends here tonight. And they remind me that the pan in Pandora actually means everything, not just a negative, not just negative emotions. So if we consider Pandora's box and it's all of its manifestation, perhaps family stories can also have immediacy and redemptive power. And to read about the grimmer parts of an author's family experience can forge a connection between writer and reader that is insightful and healing. I'd like to share with you what drove me to write our family biography. I'll begin by taking you back to 2005. That certainly is not where our story begins, but it's where I put pen to paper. In 2005, my son Nima was eight, my daughter Donia was four. Most of you here tonight who are parents might relate to this. You know how when you have kids, you feel like you're putting down roots, that feeling of settling, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but a settling that's about anchoring in depth. Well, it was in that point of my life, married, living in the suburbs, that I, a child of immigrants, was feeling for the first time I'm putting down roots. I was feeling depth that I had never felt, only to have this. It was my mother who gave me the news. After 33 years, they were going back home to Iran. She told me my father had made his decision. I had always sensed my parents' connection to Iran, but it never occurred to me that they would yield to the calling of their birthplace. The Iran they had left three decades earlier wasn't the same Iran that ex exists today. I asked myself why my father would decide it was time to go back, especially considering the fact that his damnation of the Islamic government that he had replaced the Persian monarchy and of the clerics who had forced him into self-exile was a daily occurrence in our household. Immigrants like my parents, who long to one day return to their homeland, more often than not, pine for a country that no longer exists. They become exiles not of one land, but of two countries. Why does an immigrant, even one who, like my father, a proud naturalized US citizen, decide it's time to go back home? What propels them back to their country of origin? When does the feeling of homeland become all-consuming? It's called too difficult to ignore. So imagine how I must have felt at that time, whereas I was hoping my parents, my children's grandparents, should spend more time with us. They were about to pack up and leave our lives. Iran, after all, isn't all that easy to travel to. Their decision hit me hard. I couldn't even swallow it for the first few months. Emotions started to stir in me that I had long buried, and some that I didn't even know I possessed. For example, what it felt like to be immigrants in this country through some turbulent years, the Iranian revolution, the hostage crisis, the prejudices, the insults, the struggles to get by. Everything came floating to the top in desperate need of purgatory. So I began to write. At first, the only ones I thought would ever read this were my two children. It was for them that I began to write. I wanted them to know how and why we made it to this country, what we had to go through to stay, and of course, my understanding of why my father would decide it's time to return. As I wrote and wrote, my audience changed and expanded, and here it is a book. And I can tell you, if I had gotten a good psychologist, I would have been much easier. <laughs> um, so, tough journey. Anyway, to answer the questions that I had, I started to dig into our family's past and weave it into the present. The need to go back to our family history literally consumed me. In a large part, my need to understand things was fueled by watching my mother pack for their trip back. For me, that part was heart-wrenching. Narragansett, 2005. She stands in the cluttered garage surrounded by boxes, holding a dusty and long, untouched ceramic bowl, a school project her daughter made in the fourth grade. She has kept this clay piece roughly shaped by little fingers for many years. Year after year, she has put the stuff of her life into boxes, thinking one day she may want them. That someday never came. 
Instead, she finds herself picking through boxes, meeting strange memories. She's convinced that, at 74 years of age, it is now time to put her boxes in order. She traces where her daughter's fingers had been 33 years earlier. She feels again the simple joy she felt the day her daughter brought home this shiny, glazed, hardened earth from school, proud to show off her handicraft. She had a dish towel in her hands when her daughter danced into the kitchen. She remembers thinking, how lucky my girl is to go to school while we're in America. On that day, she told her daughter, your path in life will be different than mine. Now standing in her garage, she feels that she can taste the memory. She almost feels she can taste a little clay bowl, a tormenting mixture of fondness and sadness. She wants to spit it out or hold it in. She doesn't know. So many things stir in her heart. Writing about our family tale, family, for the public was difficult. In essence, you take the, fam the public into the very private realms of your family. Iranians are known for a cultural tendency known as saving face. No matter how much we struggle inwardly, we are taught from an early age that we should hide what goes on in the family. We call it Abiru. Abiru is our allegiance to hiding ourselves to outsiders. So amidst this cultural tradition, telling our family story became even more problematic. To Virginia Woolf's quote, I would add, memory is personal. And publicizing it jeopardizes Abiru. Let me give you an example of that. In the early stages of writing the book, I gave my mom a draft to read. Actually, as a side, throughout the process, I gave my parents, um, both my parents, drafts to read, although my father was unable to read the last two chapters. Anyway, so I gave my mom a first draft to read. She read it and then asked me about a particular story that I had not included. It was about my teenage years. Until that point, I thought that the story of my teenage years had nothing to do about my parents or this book. Why included, I wrongly deduced. This is, this is what I thought. My teenage years had to do about my, what did my teenage years had to do about my parents' immigration to the United States? My mom, on the other hand, saw it differently. Your life is connected to mine, she said. How could I not be impacted? She said it had everything to do with her story of living in America. So we got into a tug of war of sorts about this. I had to ask myself, who is the story's owner, my mother or myself? I wanted full ownership, and I certainly didn't want to reveal it to the world now that I had decided to make it a book. I wanted to save my Abiru. I nearly abandoned this project. It took months of soul searching. Finally, I resolved that it's both our stories and included it. Here's a passage that speaks to the negotiation that took place between my mother and I. I don't want to give the story away. And um, so it's, it's not just about the, my teenage years, but how the story was woven together. How would you describe your life, her daughter had asked her over the phone. It was a good question. Akhtar had to admit, what will she tell her daughter when they sit down to talk? After a pause, she thinks, this is it. She fans her arms around the garage as a master of ceremonies would before its cast of actors. Right here in these boxes is the story of my life in America. She points to the jumbled lot and smiles sadly. How do I sum up the contents of these boxes, she asks herself. She realizes that to recall the events is one thing, but to string the memories together, to be the storyteller her daughter expects, is another. She knows the notes, but not the tune. If there's a song to write, a life to sum up, her daughter will have to compose it. Now she's curious to know which memories her daughter will want to reveal. Where in time should the narrative begin? Where to end? Whose accounts and which voices will she recall? What part of their life's journey will she chronicle? Which will she ignore? Akhtar wonders if her daughter will include her own teenage years or gloss over them. Now with a husband and two kids, her daughter wants to forget those years, to neatly tuck them behind a locked door. Of those years, she keeps no photographs in sight, lest her children see the ghost that once haunted their mother. But Akhtar can never forget. For her, it's an essential part of their story, of her story, of her lonely years in this country. Reza was back in Iran then, and Akhtar, a signal mother in America. Those were the years when Akhtar needed the advice and support of relatives, of loved ones. Yet they were so far away, and they would have never heard her screams of anguish. Akhtar was watching her daughter suffer, but didn't have a clue how to save her 
or to whom to turn to for help. So family biography is like a memoir. The memories we select and the ones we ignore. And some a memorist wants to ignore, but they simply can't be avoided. Those are the memories that will test one's limits. And again, to reiterate, taking the public to the private realm of your family is truly the opening of that Pandora's box. Now I'd like to read you a segment that speaks to the complicated nature of family relations. For that, I will reach deep in the bowels of that Pandora's box. Commies. Commies. While we were growing up, Commies and I were like any other brother and sister. We teased and poked at each other, laughed and annoyed one another. He once tried to flush me down the toilet. <laughs> I relate that story to my children these days, and I still manage to laugh when picturing the scene, how he dangled my head over the toilet bowl because I had played a practical joke on him. Combis was the typical Iranian brother whose family charge was to take care of, or rather, watch over his younger sister. I remember him as the person I'd run to if I had a nightmare. I never dared to go inside my parents' bedroom. I remember him tutoring on my schoolwork and passing along some of the best books I've ever read. And in my teens, if Baba ever allowed me to attend a party, Combis was my chaperone. But these days, Combis doesn't speak to me. We haven't spoken since we were in our 20s. My children have never seen their Dai, their uncle. I believe Combis has changed. I liken him to Richard Rodriguez, the Mexican-American author who writes eloquently about being estranged from his culture and his family. Combis fills that role in our family, the successful, fully assimilated American who has little empathy for the culture he has shed. Combis' story has been the most difficult for me to write about. During the process, I experienced much more emotion than I bargained for. I've, I'm sorry, that I could process. When, I write, when you write about a brother you've lost, it's like digging for a lost bond. You till dead soil, turning it over and over as you look for answers. In the muck you deal with, you plant seeds of doubt. Finally, you reap regret. In trying to portray Combs' role in our family, I've had to struggle to understand certain events. I've wondered how much of it has been fate, how much of it choice. In the end, writing about my lost brother has allowed me to comprehend deeper connections within our family roots. Connections that explain why Combis and I had a doomed relationship right from the very start. As you can tell, my relationship with my brother is severed and complicated. Combis' story here shows that there are ripple effects that go way beyond our present time and space. My relationship with him is a good example of, a, how, of how it had changed before either of us were born, conceived for that matter. The fact that our family is broken in that sense isn't anything new. Many of you can probably commiserate with that, and in fact, this is a common theme that pops up when I speak to people about this book, the fragility of family bonds. But I believe my, my broken relationship with my brother is in part due to the nature of immigration. Some of us immigrants assimilate, some of us don't. Some of us fit in easily, others not. In trying to create new identities on new soil, some of us decide it's better if we let go of our past. Immigration certainly has its affiliated costs, but there are benefits as well. If it were not for immigration, my path would have never crossed with my husband. In the highly stratified Iranian society, lines that are drawn along caste and class, we would have never been able to meet, have a relationship, much less get married. This last passage that I'm about to read speaks about my husband's final seconds on Iranian soil, just months before the Iranian Revolution. He was only 17 years old. Tehran, September 7, 27, 1978. Panicked, Hadi wants to tell his father, Baba, I've changed my mind, I don't want to leave. But he's unable to utter the words that are stuck in his throat. He simply can't raise his voice above his father's whispered prayer much less above the frenzied noise of Mehrabad airport. Go in the hands of Ali, my son, his father says, holding a Quran above his son's head. His voice, steady and comforting, recites the verses of Anyakad. Something keeps Hadi from telling his father how scared he feels. He knows that if he turns back, 
he'll shatter his old man's hopes. He also fears his father would become the butt of everyone's jokes. Hadi knows how much this trip means to his father. To buy his son a ticket, he has sold everything they own of value, a plot of land and two carpets. He knows that his father is tearing apart his most cherished possession, his greatest source of pride, his family. He knows that if he were to say that he'd had a change of heart, he'd disappoint his father. He would never be able to look him in the eye. Until they reached the airport, the notion of going to America was, a like, was like a dream, conjured by a rural adolescent's frivolous sense of adventure. Then, in that delirious airport scene, Hadi grasped the depth of what was happening. He suddenly understands that besides some cash, which his mother has sewn into the seam of his underwear, he has only himself to rely on. He realizes he's leaving home. This hits him like a brick. And it was that same type of a brick that hit me when my mother gave me their news of returning to Iran. It's that proverbial brick that led me to write about my family. In closing, I'd like to say that this is the story of Iran beyond the revolution, beyond its politics. It's the story of an Iranian family whose tradition of endurance reaches back centuries. It's a story of human toll immigration takes on our lives, both good and bad. It's the story of our family album, those stories behind the pictures that I didn't want to lose for the sake of my children. Thank you again for coming tonight.